Hello. So today I'm going to talk about the modular scheduler, which uh, has mostly been left untouched for the past 20 years. Uh, so just to begin with, a little bit of history. It has been first implemented in uh, 2004, and then in uh, 2011 there have been this little contribution of a few, so, uh, few hundred lines, about 200 lines, and nothing else since. So why that? Well, there is almost no tickets on Bugsia, which is nice, um, but does it show a lack of interest from users? And it has for a long time believed to be only for VLIW or in, others, uh, in other cores. And you need to have hardware loop support uh, to use it. One important milestone is this one. At the beginning of this year, uh, there has been a paper in HPC AGR 24, uh, which demonstrated uh, performance benefits on the A64FX, which is an out of order superscalar architecture. So, no modular scheduling is officially. Uh, as officially performance benefits on every kind of architectures. So, just so, because it has been 20 years, I, I will do a re little refresh uh, on software pipeline principles. So, the goal in when you're doing the modular scheduling is to combine multiple iterations into a new smaller kernel, which will be of length iteration interval, initiation interval cycles. I, I will call it II, it is uh, official appellation. Here you can see that rows are cycles and columns are resources. So we have one load store unit, one floating point unit, and other, which is everything else. And a grayed out cell is a wasted resource. So the goal is to waste as little resources as possible. So, how do we determine this II? Well, there is a, an inferior threshold, and to find it, you can look first at the data dependencies. Um, so here, you can see that uh, V1, do you see that? Yeah. So V1 and V2 here are used by, are consumed by this instruction. This gives us, uh, because of the latencies, uh, the, the latencies of these ones, it gives us that uh, II must be bigger than three cycles. And what about the resources? If you look at the LSU users, you have three of them. Here, here, and here. But only one LSU unit. So II must be, must be three cycles at least. You do the same for all of the other kind of resources. And it gives you, in the end, that II cannot be smaller than three cycles. So let's be optimistic and let's try with II equals three. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your first loop iteration, so iteration n, and you're gonna slide iteration n plus one by three cycles by II. And the goal is to try to mix in instructions together from across these iterations to make the new kernel. When to stop? Well when you have the optimal usage of resources, or when there is a conflict. Whatever happened first. So we keep going. We add uh, the next iteration and the next one. And there is no point in continuing because here iteration n has uh, concluded. So if we keep going on, it will just be the same. But you can see that we have no resource complex. I've here made the new kernel with uh, colored by from which iteration it came from. And you can see that we know I found a new kernel of size ii equals three. And whatever arise before it will be our prologue and after is the epilogue. Um, just a little word about Calray. Uh, so we have uh, basically um, clusters, we have a chip with clusters of 16 cores 
Uh, they share um, a memory here uh, of uh, four to eight megabytes. And on each cluster, so it is a VLIW core, um, but as I said in the introduction, modular scheduling is useful for all kinds of architectures. And we have six issues. Um, a point of importance is that we have uh, long latency loads. So here, uh, this definition, a long latency load is a load that will bypass a certain level of cache to go to a higher level of memory. So in our case, it can bypass the L1 private cache of each core to go to the SMEM, which is shared on, on the cluster. Uh, and it is 23 cycles. It has a latency of 23 cycles. So this um, brings uh, challenges to the module scheduler. And a bundle in the context of VLIW is just a set of instructions that will be executed on the same cycle, in the same cycle. So a little word about the current state of the modular scheduler in GCC. So in GCC, uh, the modular scheduler is called SMS, so Thing Modular Scheduler, and it takes place in right before register allocation. And so you have to, a loop can either be modular scheduled or go through Sched1. The tools we are given. Uh, we have to deal with single basic block content loops only. So no early exits. And so it, it looks like that. Um, we are in prepass, so we have logical registers, and we can still be disrupted by late instructions, splits, and spills from the regular. And so when you run SMS on this loop, you get this kind of scheme. A word about LLM, LLVM and uh, the state of their module scheduler. Um, they are the same tools as us, uh, so single, um, single loops and everything else. But the paper of January has been accepted. No, uh, the patch has been accepted for upstream and it has MV, modular variable expansion, uh, that we know of as well. Um, they changed the algorithm to this, and they added a few other things that are quite relevant. So, a word about um, reg moves. SMS basically just tries to schedule your instructions from time zero to infinity. So, it takes uh, all of your instructions and put their it put them like that in a linear fashion, such that they do not conflict once you roll them modulo II. So if everything went fine, you can just wrap it up and it fits really well into this array, so this is table. However, in when you build a data dependence graph, a data dependence graph like this, uh, so you, for a loop, your DDG will always be uh, cyclic because for each red after right, you will have an equivalent right after red going the other way. This is quite constrained and it can make the SMS algorithm to fail uh, a lot of time. One, if you just take one arc, then you get uh, an ordering of the nodes. And if you add a second one, it gives you um, a minimal distance in between them uh, across the iterations. So the idea is, okay, in the first time, only keep the red as a right. So we keep the ordering of the node, but we have no guarantee the lifetime, the lifetime of your variables will fit into II. But they will be ordered and they won't conflict. We still keep that, they won't conflict. And so when you do that, what can happen is this. I, it doesn't fit in this square box of length II. So here yeah, I've done the schedule from zero to infinity and I've just drawn boxes. And then the goal is to overlap the boxes. And that's how we, we do it. And it cannot fit. So what we do is we add 
a move. Well, actually, we added buff. And now it can roll without conflicts. So these are the steps. And unfortunately, the last step, inserting the move, can fail. At your given II, you may not have uh, enough slots to put your move in. So you must increase your II and redo everything. And this is what it looks like you know, in the dumps. Uh, you can see here we have two moves that have been inserted in the kernel. So modular variable expansion, which is the solution to the moves in case of long latent, when you have long latency instructions. Uh, registers moves um, were introduced by uh, Hagog in uh, 2004 as an approximation to MVE. And it turns out it doesn't work when you have long latency loads. Um, so I'm gonna go fast on this part uh, of the presentation because it's basically just a state of the art MVE. Um, so instead of inserting moves, you unroll your kernel. So what you saw before was only this line the kernel was only this line. And instead, now we'll enroll it four times, and then you rename your variable, and that's it. I, well, a few complexities, of course, but. And so this is a difference for the same loop. Here you have two moves, and here you have enrolled by a factor of four. The results, so this is compilation statistics. Uh, we are comparing the initiation interval. So the lower you get, the smaller II you get, the faster your kernel. When you can see uh, on several occurrences that uh, reg moves have a II of zero, it means it failed. Uh, so it tried to insert the move, it did not succeed, so it increased II and so on and so forth until we reached the maximal iteration attempt and it just failed and went to IFA. And what does it translate in terms of performance? Uh, yeah, Dave? Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> um, so what it translate, on the left you have uh, reg moves of uh, uh, O2 with uh, F3 vectorized. Uh, the bench is polybench, which is not uh, a very realistic bench, uh, but it was mostly for research. And uh, with trim load, so long latency loads. And on the right you have MVE on the same bench. You can see there are a lot more uh, benches shown because on the left it failed um, more times, uh, more often, and so yeah, it is quite nice. Uh, what about O3? Because all of that is nice, but so here I've run um, MVE on uh, O3, um, so O3 with module scheduling and MVE, and here are the results. So you can still see that sometimes we are more than twice slower. More the more is better. It is a relative speed up. Yes. So the baseline at one, it means you do you have the same performance as O3, and so the higher you get you you go, the better you are. It shows there is still room for improvement. <laughs> um, know about rescaling strategies. So. It is unclear what to do in the second path of scheduling. So in SCED1, you can so either choose SCED1 or, or SMS. Then you do your register allocation, and then you will have new instructions, possibly. Uh, so you have to run another scheduler. Uh, usually it is done with IFA, which is just run once again. Um, but IFA doesn't know about your modular schedule and will disrupt it. So what should we do? 
So here is our uh, starting point. It is the uh, modular schedule we have. Um, in blue, you can see reg moves. And no matter, you can just notice that it is uh, eight cycles long. So II is eight. So without any rescheduling strategy, you choose not to run Sched2. Then you won't get any bundling. So your instructions won't be packed together into a bundle. And you won't uh, take um, you won't take any action on new instructions. So here it has been in yellow, it has been introduced by the register allocator. The existing solution is this flag, which basically says, okay, run IFA as on any other loop. Um, the issue is that IFA is um, a list as a list scheduling algorithm, which is acyclic. It doesn't know about interiteration, interiteration latencies, which modular scheduling is made for. So we get a suboptimal. Um, schedule of 10 cycles. So the first idea was, okay, so we have just modular scheduled our loops, can we preserve it? And to do that, I've added a solution which is a bit uh, target specific. Um, well, it won't work on, yeah, on some VLIWs, but it will work on in-order and all kind of VLIW architectures. Um, so the idea is really simple. You add anti dependence, so right after read dependencies of cost zero in between all of your instructions so that um, IFA is still run, but it won't move your instructions around. It will only run um, the embedded bundler. And so we get back to eight cycles. Yeah. However, in all three, it doesn't work as well. So how does it perform over the naive solution? quite well um, in O2. Um, as I've said, in O3, naive is better by almost 20%. But we've got something here. Um, and so if we make uh, just a summary of the strategy so far, um, naive is good when O3 beats SMS because you run the same schedule as O3, so you can converge to O3. Um, and it considers regular pollution. The new strategy, well, is not target agnostic, preserve module scheduling, but will ignore every uh, side effects from the register allocator. So we have to meet in the middle. And to do that, there is this uh, new strategy, uh, this new strategy which is uh, target agnostic, um, inspired by mail scheduling, if you know about this uh, paper. So basically, um, in a basic block, your instructions will have a certain latency. It makes it impossible to schedule a consumer before a certain amount of time uh, after the producer, the corresponding producer. And so all of that is well, but when you're acyclic, you lose the knowledge of the latency dangles. That is, the, latency, the latencies of your instructions scheduled at the end of your block. So if you have two blocks, one after the other, you cannot do uh, as you want. And if there is a consumer in the second block, the one below, using a variable from the first one, it cannot be before the latency of the prefix and of the suffix ends. So the idea is to use this information to uh, reuse it by duplicating, juxtaposing the same loop, exact same loop. We do no renaming. We only copy paste it n times, and we make a new larger block. This one here outlined. Additionally, we had a frontier, a barrier here, which um, prevents uh, instructions from the last block to go above and instructions from above going below. We make this new block 
So we give a partial cyclic context to Spock, and we schedule it using IFA. And then we extract the last block, which has been scheduled by IFA, but given the context of the latency angles. And it shows um, an improvement in O3 as well, which wasn't the case before. Um, so always take the numbers with uh, precautions because it is on polybench. Um, but it shows that the ID is good and it is our target agnostic. And so this is the, la the latest strategies, uh, the latest strategy which has been uh, studied, and I recommend this one if you ever use the module scheduler, because it only improves, or it either do nothing or improves, so even by a few percent. Um, the issue is there is also no support of late splits and spills, as I've said before. If you remember the yellow copy instruction, we have no knowledge of it uh, in SMS. So the idea is to add move for naming constraints directly in SMS. So it, isn't, it is still experimental and in development, um, but the proof of concept of three weeks ago shows that uh, it is a promising idea. Certainly we have uh, performance drops uh, in, on some benches, but analysis has, has shown that uh, it was expected given the early stage of development. Um, it, it's not something due to the idea, but only due because uh, the development isn't finished. Um, so about uh, the naming constraints, I, 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 certainly there is a, an official name out there, but I don't know it. So some instructions which have many operands, um, usually it is uh, conditional moves or FMA, they have naming a name constraint on their operands to save encoding space. So on the left, if you take a generic FMA, so I've just dropped the round, but anyway. In RTL, in the prepass, um, every operand will have its own name, which is not necessarily the case on your ISA. On our ISA, um, the last operand must have implicitly uh, must be implicitly the same as the first one, uh, as the destination which acts as an accumulator. For the next slides, I, I will use shapes, just so we are not confused by uh, ugly RTL. Um, and so we have this FMA, and if we just uh, assign colors to it and shapes, it looks like that. And on the right, it is if you only uh, preserved the uh, destination and the operand with the naming constraint. Currently in GCC, LRA constraints is the one responsible to satisfy the naming constraints. So it receives this RTL and it sees that, okay, this um, square must have the same name as the, circ the circle. So what it does is it adds two moves, one before and one after, to be conservative. And then it renames within the instruction. At the end of LRA though, you can have either both are known of the moves that has been that have been uh, removed, depending on if they were coalesced or not. So, what we are attending to do 
intending to do is to satisfy these constraints directly in SMS, so before register allocation is done. Why? Because ideally, you want to do the bundle only strategy. Um, if modular, your modular schedule was perfect, you could just keep it as such. It would be register allocated, but you can just keep it as such. Um, but the benchmarks have shown that constraint moves um, appear, and when they cannot fit within an existing row, uh, when there isn't a slot available for them, you take a one cycle penalty. If you have a huge loop and a lot of FMAs, then it can increase by quite a few cycles. So the idea is to add those moves, but only one. Uh, there were two moves, and we will only be adding the first one as a pre-move, because it's uh, sufficient. In so, given the DDG from before on the left, which still has every dependencies, um, yeah, you have this instruction which is uh, constrained uh, as a name constraint. And so we'll add this move into the DDG. And then we add uh, anti dependencies appropriately. And well, we just make a nice and correct sound uh, DDG. As it looks like in an actual dump of DDG. Uh, well, you can see here that we have this constraint operation. Oh, by the way, the dump of DDG is new feature, but well, <laughs> it's practical for debugging. And so we have this constraint operation, and we add this move, and then we draw the current spanning edges. So, O2 coalesce a constraint move. You have three cases. Case one. Well, your move uh, cannot be coalesced because you have interference in between your live ranges. So here you have uh, you have users of this uh, you have users of blue, and you have the move and users of the diamond. And if their live range interfere, of course you cannot remove the move. Uh, because otherwise it will share the same name and it won't be correct anymore. Case two, uh, we are certain the move can be coalesced. Then you remove it, you add dependencies, and this is the specificity of doing that uh, in SMS compared to doing it in your register allocator. In your register allocator, you just remove the move, the move and you do not attempt to reschedule everything. Um, here, that's what we try to do. Uh, we will reschedule the loop after we have removed the, loop, the, the move. So you remove it, you add right after read dependencies, I will see on the slide after, and you rename everything. And the K3 is, well, you're not sure. Because you can have uh, reg moves, the one we, we've we talked about before, and which are basically live range splits, and they are not consistent in between two schedule, so you cannot be certain. And the decision then is to remove the move and do nothing else. You do not rename everything, you just do as it was before. So case two, here you have your move on the left, and it turns out it can be coalesced. So you simply pop it, and then you rename diamonds into circles everywhere, and you add write after read, artificial write after read dependencies. This will make this will constrain the DDG um, in the next uh, iteration of the schedule. It will make it such that you have an ordering, you have no constraint on distance, but you will have an ordering of the nodes of the, the, the users on the right 
won't be uh, in between here. Uh, there won't be schedule in between those. Uh, so it will be well separated and you guarantee that the live ranges won't uh, interfere. And case three, um, which is simple, <laughs> you simply remove the mood and uh, restore the DDG and do a fee as if uh, nothing ever happened. Why do we do that um, here? Because it is not necessarily correct. It's because if you miss out a move, you miss out on a move, then you still have the register allocation that will uh, correct you. It will reintroduce the move. You will take a one cycle penalty at most, but well, it's only one cycle. If we kept the move, and it, then the register allocation decides that it has to be removed, it is an unnecessary um, move, then your penalty is unbounded because you will have scheduled your loop around this move with this move in it. And so you may have increased your II by an arbitrary amount. So the penalty would be much higher. Reminder uh, of the typical SMS workflow. So you create your DDG, you run SMS. So you have, if you do reg moves, you will have those little lightning symbols, which uh, we've seen before. And then you insert your moves. You, so you basically inserting a move is resolving live range overflows. Um, so it can either be with reg moves or with MV, whatever you choose. And you repeat it until you success, successfully schedule your loop or you, you hit your, your bound. Now the new workflow uh, with constraint in it. The, two, uh, the first step is still the same. You create your DDG with your regular nodes. Um, then you analyze everything and you add all of your naming constraints. You can take a tiny decision here. Sometimes, on some cases, you can already know that the move won't be useful. Um, but it's almost, almost all of them are inserted. Then you run SMS as usual. You resolve your life ranges. And then you go through all of your new moves and you look, okay, which one can be coalesced? And so you coalesce all of the, all of the moves that you can. Uh, it's not only one. If you can do all of them, you remove all of them. And you reschedule everything. So that's why we have added dependencies. Because contrary to the register allocator here, we attempt to reschedule everything. Considerations for, and I'm well ahead of time. Um, considerations for the, this part is that uh, first, the algorithm, algorithm stops, obviously, because we only add at the beginning, and then we will only remove until we cannot remove anymore. Um, as I've said before, it is better to forget a concerned move, because the penalty uh, is bonded to one cycle for each move. And so the reg moves, the live range, live range splits, which are either reg moves or MVE. Between two iterations of scheduling, they are not clearly related. One may appear that wasn't here before, and another one might disappear, although, well, you add it. So this is the kind of thing that affects your coalescing opportunities and that makes it uh, not always certain. You cannot always guarantee that your move is necessary. And in what order should this is uh, the heuristic I have to think about and I'm not quite sure about what I should do here. 
is so you have the list of moves and um, how do you process them? Do you take your instructions in the lexicographical order you have them? Or do you uh, add a certain priority on a move because it comes from a highly constrained instruction in your current schedule? So how do you shoot it? And coalescing cannot be, uh, uh, yeah, it's the most important part is this one, because it cannot be determined exactly, we have to have this heuristic as to whether we can remove the move or we cannot. There are classical coalescing criteria, such as uh, JAWS, George Criterion, but George Criterion is conservative, so if a move might increase register pressure, it is not deleted. Um, here we want something a bit more aggressive because we don't, we, we will be able to um, be corrected by the register allocator and we are not certain about the register pressure yet. So, yeah. It is better to, and once again, it is better to miss a move than to add the next one. So yeah, conclusion. 20 years of being on the naughty list. Here are the two uh, gift boxes are actual new features from right now. Um, everything else has been forgotten. Nothing has been done since uh, the original implementation. And yet, I hope this uh, presentation has shown you that uh, there are opportunities for modular scheduling and it is not a thing of the past. So yeah, a lot of things remain to be done. Um, maybe uh, about the DFA here, um, it is actually not exact. It's only that DFA is not made for uh, a cyclic, for cyclic usage of resources. So we would have to either use something else or I don't know. I, currently you have to iterate through each cycle and attempt things and it's quite time consuming when you're module scheduling your loop. And another thing important that LLVM has done is to have register pressure heuristics and to add um, I can go to the next slide and to add um, a register allocator directly in SMS. So if you're at all interested in contributing to the modular scheduling, um, here is a to-do list. Uh, this one is, is as well, but I've extended it. Um, so support more loops. It has been done in 2005. Uh, for Spark architecture in LLVM, but it has been removed in uh, 2009 by, I believe, a husband, uh, because it is uh, Miss Latner. Yes. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, support more loops. And uh, here for small loops, it could be worth it to have an optimal uh, integer lin linear programmation based. Uh, modular scheduler because it, it would not take that much time. And yeah, so the most important feature is to support more loops by adding early exits. For the register pressure, it would not make the constraint moves uh, useless because um, you, so you register allocate once, you do not reschedule after it. So the constraint move will still be relevant in, in the way that you would take them into account in your schedule, and then you would just register allocate. Add stage scheduling. So this is a paper. Um, I'm not going into much detail here. It's only so you can move around your columns. Uh, you can just rotate them so you reduce your register pressure. And yeah, for MV, MV is actually 
um, a huge heuristic, you have no guarantees at all, no guarantees on how much you're going to enroll, and no guarantee on how much registers you're going to use. Um, there are implementations papers out there, such as uh, the meeting graph with uh, this extension. Well, it's another paper, but uh, which guarantee that uh, you use a minimal number of registers. And finally, for the constraints, well, uh, experiments has, have to be done uh, on the coalescer um, to design our own uh, heuristic. And should we go in post-pass? Because most uh, industrial modular scheduler are in post-pass. Uh, well, not necessarily, because at Calray we also have uh, another post-pass modular scheduler. And benches, which is not only polybench, um, benchmarks show that uh, it's complementary. Uh, so one does not always beat the other. Um, so we might as well keep it in prepass, and it's good. So that's it. And I say during my dry runs that I would be out of time. So if you have questions, otherwise I have <laughs> a lot of remaining slides for details. But yeah, do you have questions? So yeah. why does it say confidential? <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's just. Uh, like slides provided by my company, it's not. <laughs> you can freely use it. It's a, yeah. Hi, can you scroll back to the page with the packages, the gifts? The gifts, gifts. yes. That list, thank you. Uh, <laughs> which of those do you want to see most? Which are you, are you not going to do, but you want to see? Oh, sorry. This, this one of those things are you not going to do, but you want to see someone else do it. Yeah. This one yeah. do you want most? Yeah, yeah it, would be, it would be nice to this. Which of those do you want to see most? Yeah. Uh, and, and this, the one I would like to see are, um, well, this one would be nice. And and this one as well, so we can support, well, it's a right. bit of, right. yeah, but if you have rotating registers, you can, it would be nice to use it. And uh, the other one would be that. So, of course, when you have a, a register-based dependency cannot be mm -hmm. higher than, uh, cannot have a distance higher than one, um, but for memory dependencies, it can be higher. So, this would help in supporting more loops. I, I think the... What I would like um, right now is uh, features that support, helps to support more loops. Uh, this would be good. So, yeah, same here, uh, support more loops. And secondly would be register pressure heuristic. Yeah. Because some benches, some benchmarks, so Lam, Monica Lam has said in her paper, uh, so she was the one to uh, talk about yeah. MV. And, uh, yeah. uh, but it's a heuristic, and uh, yeah. looking at papers is not too good for heuristics, because heuristics yeah. for GCC will be different than heuristics for anything else. Exactly. So yeah. You have to try that stuff. Uh, and rela somewhat related, uh, for a normal machine, a normal risk-like machine, right? uh, which of those things would be most important, do you think? For drink machines, for um, normal, well, global, yeah. Machines, right. Well, the loops, the loops is well something in general, of course. Um, but among that, for general machines, would be yeah, probably predicated instructions. For yeah, would if be nice. Have those, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, did you try to explore selective scheduler because it can uh, do software pipelining and yeah. not only software pipelining of uh, simple loops but loops with yeah. if statements? Yeah, I haven't run it. <laughs> I, well, basically, I was uh, hired to work on the module scheduler and I haven't tried uh, selective scheduler. Yeah, because it's uh, yeah. Was designed specifically for very 
election instruction world processors. Yeah, true. Uh -huh. And another thing, actually, uh, you can use uh, uh, some code from register locator, for example. Yeah. Register locator does uh, correlation completely for pseudos which got hard register, but there is uh, implicitly, but uh, there is uh, code uh, for explicit correlation. It's yeah. done for pseudos uh, which got uh, uh, stack slots. And it's uh, aggressive correlation, of course, mm -hmm. because it's for stack slots. You could uh, use this code for your purposes. Yeah. As for DFA, it also could be uh, modified to work with different uh, initiation intervals. Um, but I'm not sure how big it will be, uh, the final automata. So you can, uh, uh, you can modify this. Uh, actually, a long time ago, I tried to implement uh, a perfect scheduling in mm -hmm. GCC and uh, consider this option for okay. uh, extending DFA. Okay. Um, but about the coalescing um, in uh, array at the moment, so I've tried looking into it, um, but does it work only on memory-to-memory -memory moves? Yeah. yeah, okay. But then... It could be done for any simple, simply it's uh, right now working on the I have a question here, but kind of towards Vlad here. Uh, with, the, with the instructions like the FMA type stuff, I know on Power we also have that for our FMA, where we have to have one of the source be the same register as the destination. And the copies, I, I think, are actually generated from LRA, right, during the spelling. It seems like during the register allocation portion in IRA that we don't try for the in patterns that have matching constraints, we don't use that information in coloring, right? Should we be doing that? Trying to, trying to get the source and destination to the same thing so we don't have to actually insert those copies at all? Assuming, of, of course, that the source is dead. It, it's trying to do this. That's why it's called uh, integrated register allocator. It's trying to do implicitly by assigning uh, hard registers, the same hard registers when it's possible. So you know, and if it's fail, then in LRA you you add instructions. So I'd had a thought, just because that's the way it was handled. Was do we need a kind of a prepass that goes in and forces those? Uh, matching trains to actually the same pseudo, you know, hence yeah. copy, and so then see them. Yeah, it's, uh, it's possible. Yeah, about. It's possible. I thought about this, but I never tried this approach. So okay. maybe it, it will work. I don't know. And generate a better code. I don't know. Uh, you just need to implement it to an experiment. See if it helps on average, right? It's your risk deck, so. Uh, the problem with that, uh, there are um, description where for uh, one alternative you need to use uh, the same ring stand for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the problem. So maybe for PowerPC it could work, but for other. So it could be an optional pass. Okay. Uh, for power, it's not a big deal. We don't have, well, for classical power anyway. But we don't have many instructions that have constraints on them. We would have to well, have the mask insert instructions. Those, those are RLWIMI. That's the classical things that you see most. We, we do that instruction quite a bit. But it already has like five operands or something. The hard that people could do six, something like it, but <laughs> yeah. yeah.
but there's always uh, it, uh, input and output have to be the same. It's uh, always big problem. You see, you see it if you look at a, at a past dump, right? You know, mm. It's always a problem that it has to be the same. You really want to see, well, the pseudos anyway. You just want to see new, fresh pseudos everywhere. It's so much, so much nicer. Yeah, my experience with register locator, you uh, you should avoid to uh, add some code and, and then uh, remove it after that. Try to remove it after that. Usually it, it doesn't work <laughs> well. But uh, I remember my first approach to the register locator. Uh, I tried to insert exactly this uh, Instruction, for example, for two op instructions, hmm. and trying to remove them, it didn't work well. So you talked about the George coalescer issue. Is does modular yeah. scheduling have its own coalescer in it, uh, or where's sorry. the coalescer? George coalescer. Yeah, uh, it's a criterion to select if your move uh, will. Increase the register pressure when yeah, we moved well, on. Yes, I'm familiar with the coalescing, yeah. but I'm talking about do we actually have a co just coalescer no, in no. GCC? Not yet. Oh, you're talking about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, is this. All the papers I've ever seen on coalescing is more aggressive is better. I mean. Yeah, and well, it would be the case, especially here, we want something more aggressive. And George, uh, there is a coalescer in uh, integrated register, like yeah. it's called the ER. IRA uh, coalesce and uh, yeah. it coalescing uh, pseudos which didn't get hard registers and therefore it's aggressive. Of yeah, course. yours is based on inference, right? No, no, it's uh, done during um, uh, after you assigned uh, registers, hard registers uh, uh, globally. So there is a coalescing stack slots. Not such slots, pseudos, uh, which so get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you when you assign globally hard registers to most of pseudos, some pseudos uh, didn't get registers, and they they are coalesced after that. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> To come back to your um, statement that there were no uh, bug reports for module scheduling, um, there are reasons for this. Uh, I came across a lack of module scheduling a number of times for in-order processors, um, but that usually happened very early in the uh, making of a port. So you can't point to a port where something doesn't work because the port isn't in tree yet because it's not complete and often it's still confidential. And um, besides, even if you could uh, provide all the necessary stuff, yeah. it wouldn't match with the schedule because when you want to have mem copy, you want to have it right now because it's very fundamental. Um, in an ideal world, you would just describe your loads and stores and moves and the compiler would uh, transform a simple loop into one that's optimally uh, scheduled and with good register allocation. But what I see is not only doesn't it do module scheduling in a sensible way, it also lacks uh, strength reduction and uh, post-increment optimization. So what I end up is just um, slap in an opaque pattern and uh, after reload it gets uh, expanded an optimal code. Um, yeah, so then this thing is done, and it's a point where the port is published. And yeah, I, sorry. I, sorry, the beginning, I forgot. Sorry. I mean, so a bit, yeah, here of the heart so of the. The problems thing. exist, but it's not um, effective to. Uh, file bug reports when the problems arise. Yeah. Isn't the main issue... Isn't the main issue that we don't turn modular scheduling on for any... Because it's 
optimization level so no one uses it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, but you can you, you, you can actually fake hardware loops. So we have attempted on uh, it was on RIS five. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on ARM and RIS five, yeah, we've just tricked it into believing there were hardware loops and then at the end we would uh, just reestablish uh, uh, well a condition and jump. So it works. No dash O any number turns it on. Yeah. Right. So not, not, not by default. No. Yeah. 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 You have to explicitly yeah, yeah. The, the arc is so 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 over the years it has been on by default for PowerPC in a whole bunch of experiments, not just by me. It's uh, but it never was actually beneficial to enable it. Uh, there always were some things that work better, but on efforts it, it even degraded. So it would be great if he could, could enable it by default. Yeah. Because it actually is beneficial in many cases. But, well, we cannot turn module scaling by default because of this. <laughs> um, actually, I think it would be better to Especially because MVE um, is not very well um, compatible with um, loop unrolling because then you unroll way too much and you increase your register pressure. So I think the, um, the preferred solution would be to have a pragma, a new pragma. So you can say this loop has to be module scheduled or should not be module scheduled. Um, and even with the strategies afterward, um, sometimes some strategy may perform them better than another on a given loop. Uh, so yeah, if we had new pragmas, it, rather than turning it on by default, it would be better, I think. That will be used even less. Than yeah. <laughs> it's true. Hmm? Yeah, it w yeah, it would be awesome. Uh, it would be a nice, uh, exactly, profile-based feedback to turn it on would be nice. Actually, it would be uh, something to add to module scheduling as well, um, I think, a new extension. Yeah, that's good. Thank you.